The last couple NASA appliances that I've looked at on the channel left quite a bit to be desired, either in terms of hardware or software. While I did end up recommending them overall, I also wondered if I could just run TrueNAS or some other operating system on them to make these devices that much better. I've tried it. Now you don't have to. Server room, this is the captain. Rhett, is there something going on down there I need to know about? Ah! We're on UPS backup, sir! The main paradigm couplers have come on a line! Uh, the tachyon routers are tangled with the secondary gazon In router. English, Mr. Rhett? It's the bandwidth, sir! Getting it down's not the problem, it's getting it back up! Well, do what you can, but remember, I've got a budget here. I'm gonna have to call you back. Hosting your own servers also means you get to host all your own problems. Even the most skilled chief engineers will tell you you should decentralize your network. So why not host your services with Linode? If it runs on Linux, it'll run on Linode. They offer shared CPU plans for as little as $5 per month and can scale as high as you need to go with dedicated CPUs, S3 compatible object storage, GPU hosting, NVMe block storage, and more. Linode is also expanding at light speed, with 12 new global data centers planned before the end of 2023. Visit linode.com slash craft computing and get a $100 60-day credit just for signing up for a new account. That's linode.com slash craft computing, and again, thanks to Linode for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. One of the most asked questions I've received on the last couple NAS appliance reviews has been, are you able to run alternative operating systems on them or are you stuck with what's already installed? And while the two appliances on the table here today are just x86 CPUs and standard PC hardware, the answer is so much more complicated than that. We'll start with the more difficult option and that is what's left of this Synology Disk Station DS923+. Before it reached this state of disassembly, I did do some research on Synology's practices of locking down their hardware to their OS, and the news isn't great. While some of their enterprise rack mount units are pretty open when it comes to BIOS or hardware restrictions, their appliances like this one, not so much. But I also wanted to tear it down and see for myself if there were any obvious answers or shortcuts to be able to install my own OS, no matter how unlikely that might be. As a quick rewind for those who didn't see the original video, the DS923 Plus doesn't have any video outputs or any video graphics hardware of any kind. So simply plugging in a monitor to this and installing an OS is not going to be an option. And even though I was able to locate a serial COM port, which would allow installing something like TrueNAS Core, unfortunately Synology also implements a custom bootloader that is hard coded onto this board. And while it's not encrypted, there's also not any known workarounds for this as well. So unless you feel like soldering a serial header and then reverse engineering Synology's bootloader, you're not going to be running anything other than DSM on this hardware. And that makes me sad, both from an e-waste and from a I bought hardware, I should be able to use it the way I want to use it standpoint. So if you were watching this video to figure out how to true NAS swap your Synology NAS, this is the end of the video for you. Go buy something from the merch store to make me feel a little bit better about wasting my time thinking I could actually make this happen. <laughs> so now onto something with a little bit more control in the hardware in the TerraMaster T6, as it's running a Celeron N5095 with a standard AMI BIOS, all with video output over HDMI. So things are already starting to look up. Much like the DS923, the system does have eMMC on board, as well as a pair of M.2 slots for NVMe drives. Powering on the system reveals it's just a PC, and entering the BIOS allows us to both enable the NVMe disks as boot devices, and then boot into the TrueNAS scale installer. Here, I'm able to select my NVMe drives for RAID 1 installation, and everything went exactly as I'd expect on a normal PC. So let's give it a reboot and jump into TrueNAS. At least, I was hoping it would be that simple. Upon rebooting the system, the T6 automatically set the boot device back to the built-in eMMC. So instead of TrueNAS booting up for the first time, I landed back inside of Terra OS. Jumping into the BIOS, it seems that the NVMe drives were back to their default disabled state in the boot menu. So I turned them back to the default boot device again, saved changes, and rebooted. And here's where things really started going off the rails. When the system powered back on, it immediately went back into Terra OS on the eMMC. 
Rebooting and getting back into the BIOS showed the NVMe drives again had been disabled by the boot menu. So I enabled them for the fourth time, and this time manually selected them as the boot device without rebooting the system. And I was greeted with true NAS firing up. Sweet, problem solved, right? Well, while TrueNAS ran about as well as you'd expect for having a Celeron N5095 and 32 gigabytes of memory, as soon as I rebooted, you guessed it, right back to Terra OS, a la the eMMC. And let me tell you, I tried just about everything I could think of to make this setting stick, from creating user profiles, resetting CMOS manually, disabling the eMMC as a boot device. There was absolutely nothing I could do to get TerraMaster's hooks out of this AMI BIOS. So if I can't run TrueNAS from the pair of NVMe drives, I could probably just install it onto the eMMC that T6 wants so desperately to boot from in the first place. But rather than going forward, let's rewind the tape back to when I installed TrueNAS for the first time. See the install disk selection screen here and see how there's no mention of the eMMC drive listed here? Yeah, me too. So not only can you not set the custom boot device and make it stick through a reboot in the BIOS, you also can't overwrite the eMMC from outside Terra OS or their install wizard. I even went as far as to rip the BIOS off of this device and edit it with the AMI BIOS editor that I've done for X79 and X99 Chinese market motherboards in the past. And I could not find one reference to returning to default settings every time the device powers off or is rebooted, or why it keeps disabling my NVMe drives as a boot disk. Trust me, I spent hours trolling through this BIOS and could not figure this out for the life of me. Now, on the plus side, if you did want to run TrueNAS on this, you could just manually go into the BIOS and set your boot device every single time you wanted to reboot the server. But as a server, I wouldn't recommend it. Like I mentioned, practices like this, that is hardware with proprietary software lock-ins, frustrate and piss me off to absolutely no end. I understand companies wanting customers to buy into their ecosystems, enticing them with first party offers, and in general, turning one-time customers into repeat customers. On the surface, that's the essence of good business sense. But when that's not an organic process, meaning if you purchase a product one time and are then forced to become a repeat customer from inside of your walled garden, that's a practice that will make someone like me actively avoid all of your products in the future. Like I mentioned in my review of the Synology DS923 Plus and the TerraMaster T6, while turnkey solutions like this are highly sought after by a number of small and medium-sized businesses, some of which don't have dedicated IT support, Hardware lock-ins make things extraordinarily difficult to expand your servers as your business grows. Maybe it's time for someone to take a serious look at the NAS appliance market and bring a product that is open source, expandable, and still affordable without relying on first-party software tie-ins. Who knows, maybe that's a future expansion of craftcomputing.store. Oh wait, that's me. For now, you'll just have to settle for some awesome glassware. But as always, let me know down below in the comments what you thought about this one and did this help you decide or decide against buying a NAS appliance like this. As always, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on the social medias at Craft Computing. And if you like the content you see on this video and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Ah, nice thing about buying crawlers, I have another pint of this I have to drink now. Beer for today, I don't often see on tap, and so I figured I would give it a whirl. This is a Northwest Standard from Breakside Brewery. It is the Wanderlust IPA, clocking in at 7.5%. And I hate trying to pour beer from crawlers with every fiber of my being. <laughs> Boy, sometimes draft just hits a little differently. Ah. Oh. Oh God, that's a good summer beer. Oh, that is super, not super crisp, like Pilsnery crisp. Uh, more like, it's still very much a Northwest IPA, but it is so much lighter 
on your tongue than those the the dank bombs as i like to call them the those hop forward grassy weedy type uh type ipas that turns this into a very refreshing very crisp and still very drinkable northwest ipa i like it the thing i like most about wanderlust it's not overly complicated it, it is a solid, near-double IPA. It is crystal clear, and it doesn't make you think about evolution of flavor or, you know, confuse your brain with all kinds of different malts and hops. This is, as I mentioned at the beginning, kind of a quintessential Northwest staple. It is delicious. It has all of the right hop profiles without any of the nuance that you need to be a more advanced IPA drinker. It's just good. And sometimes good is all you want. 